Good afternoon. Wilson, welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Robert Daly. I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here at Wilson. And we are very glad uh, to have as our guest this afternoon, who I think is very well known to many members of our audience. Uh, we've worked with him in many cases for years. He is the former vice president of the Henry Luce Foundation and also the former chair of the Harvard Yanjing Institute, the Lingnan Foundation, and the Yale China Association. He has been a leader and a fixture uh, in educational and philanthropic work uh, between the United States and China for decades. Uh, he is also the author most recently of John Birch, A Life, uh, that came out in 2015, uh, the story of the young American who was killed by communists in China in 1945. Uh, but he has also written widely about uh, cultural and educational relations. He wrote uh, a chapter on the cultural relationship for the volume which David Shambaugh edited in 2012, Tangled Titans, the United States and China. He wrote a chapter on Christian higher education in China, the life of Francis C.M. Wei in 2012. And then he and I were part of a, a panel together before I ever came to Wilson back in 2011, uh, when we there was a conference here on the United States and China mutual perceptions. And Terry wrote a chapter then on United States views of China, history, values, and power. We have him in today uh, to talk about his most recent book, Americans in China, Encounters with the People's Republic, which is just out from the Oxford University Press. And in this book, Terry tells the stories of Americans who have lived and worked in China uh, from the beginning of its revolution until the present time, a series of narrative histories of cold warriors, uh, prisoners of war, leaders in business, in diplomacy, uh, in academia. And in the course of telling their stories, he ends up uh, really giving a, an introduction, a crash course in modern Chinese history. If you haven't read the story of modern Chinese history, don't worry, this book will take you through it uh, with great points of entry. People who have uh, often from their childhoods been involved with China. Uh, in most cases, people who've been in China uh, throughout their lives. Uh, this is, this, the frame of this book in some ways is not borrowed from, but it's an homage in part to Jonathan Spence's uh, to change China, uh, which came out in 1980 and which so effectively used this format of telling the histories of foreigners who had been involved with China uh, really since from the uh, Ming Dynasty on. And I wanted to ask, uh, Terry, before you get into telling the stories of three of the people that you've profiled in the book, uh, why you wanted to write it now, at this time in US-China relations and in global affairs, when most writers are going big, this is the return of great power competition where suddenly back in the 19th century was the way that John Kerry uh, put it a few years ago. Uh, and we're you know, talking about grand strategy, the balance of power, people have gone big. You haven't gone small exactly, but you've gone very personal. You, you've chosen a, a point of entry into these issues, uh, which is both political, but also intimate, individual stories. Why did that seem like the right move to make now? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Well, uh, before I uh, try to answer, let, let me express my uh, appreciation uh, to you for the work that you've d done at the Wilson Center and elsewhere. But I also want to uh, thank the Wilson Center because it was actually uh, Back in 2010, when I was a, a public policy uh, fellow at the Wilson Center, that the seeds of this idea for this book were planted. And I've even got my Wilson Center mug uh, to prove that I, that I, was, I was there. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and to answer your question, you're exactly right. Uh, Every, everybody's talking about uh, big power strategy and the rise of China and the Thucydides trap and, and so on and so forth. But I, I think not only now, but always, it's extremely important to look at the, the human dimension and to, mm -hmm. you know, to, it's, it's the people who make these stories, these policies, these strategies. Uh, they're, they're, they're the ones who, who make these things real. And to the extent that we do talk about people, 
we often uh, are focused almost entirely on leaders. Uh, David Sham, uh, who, who you just mentioned, has written a, a, a marvelous book uh, on uh, recently on the past of uh, five or six Chinese leaders. And uh, that is essential, it's important, but I, I, I wrote this because I think uh, it's equally important to get beyond the headlines and to provide a sense of context and texture to the relationship. Well, that you know, leads to another broad theme that I wanna come back to after you've gone through your case studies. Uh, but it, it seemed reading the book that, that, that one of the themes, it was sort of an, an homage, a love letter to engagement uh, in many ways. Your stories precede engagement and, and begin to post-date it. Uh, but we're, we're, we're looking back now at this period, um, really from 1979, people date at different times, but to 2016, when the United States and China be believed in their co-evolution and individuals and institutions uh, were coming together uh, and working together to solve problems and try to increase their mutual understanding. There's a phrase we don't hear much anymore in US-China relations, mutual understanding. Uh, but there is a discourse in the United States of thinking back it, uh, to the engagement era with a degree of nostalgia, a degree of regret. Uh, some Americans look at it as mistaken as the time in which we raised up a tiger. Uh, was that part of your motivation is, is one question. Were you, were you thinking about the engagement era and maybe it's, it's twilight? And then I guess another question is, is there a discourse like this in China? Have, have any books like this been written from the Chinese side looking the other way? Do you have any sense whether Chinese now are, are writing books like yours about a now past era of involvement? Is there a mirror discourse on the Chinese side? Um, I, I hope there is, Robert, and, uh, but I can't, really, I, I can't point uh, to any specific examples. Yeah. I mean, uh, you and I and others, you know, we, we all have uh, friends and colleagues who uh, lament the fact that U.S.-China relations have entered such a difficult period and who uh, are uh, much more wary of what we call engagement. Uh, but I, I guess I would argue that uh, we have always been in, engaged in one way or another, even during the Cold War. And so the first half of my book, uh, before norm, normal, normalization, uh, before we really had the ability to be uh, much more directly engaged, uh, tells the story of, uh, uh, of a few people who, uh, despite uh, Cold War isolation, decided that they would learn about China for themselves. And so it does include the story of a couple of American POWs who were taken prisoner in Korea and who decided there were 21 of them altogether. And they decided rather than returning to the United States, they would, they would go to China. And this was mind boggling for the American public. They, uh, they thought, how could any American uh, uh, turn their back and go to a place like Red China, uh, and uh, they were accused of being brain brainwashed and so forth. But they had uh, remarkably, some of them, not all of them, uh, some of them left very early, but the two that I, I wrote about were able to get university educations. They were able to marry and have children. Eventually, they did come back to the U.S. Uh, the other side of it is I, I included a chapter on Walter Judd, who was the quintessential cold warrior. He was a member of Congress for 20 years. And Judd was interesting to me because uh, he had been a medical missionary in China. Uh, but uh, with the advent of the Cold War, he advocated strongly and he was very effect for isolating and containing China. And what was so interesting to me about Judd's case was that so much of his rhetoric 
which used to seem, seem old, not just old fashioned, but just wrong headed. Uh, you know, he's looking at uh, you know, communist China as an ideolo ideolo ideological threat. Now uh, has c come back with a, a vengeance and it's, it, it rings much more uh, current. Uh, I don't know if it's altogether true, but it's, it's back in the, in the headlines. So anyway, part of, part of my approach was to, uh, to present, present this collage of ideas and opinions, uh, top topics, and uh, major turning points. And I, I guess to uh, go back to you know, the, the first part of, part of your question, uh, I hope that there will be Chinese who will be able to write a kind of the mirror image story from their side. We, we really need that. You also tell the stories of some of the American reds or pinks or fellow travelers who went to build new China and stayed. You, you focused on of course, the Hintons, but you get some of Joseph Epstein in that as well. Just fascinating history that uh, I'm afraid, but for books like yours, might 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 soon be forgotten because that that era uh, is so you know now solidly over. But let, let's go into um, three of your chapters or three of your case studies, and just to give our listeners today a, a taste for that. Uh, but before you do that, I want to tell everybody that we'd we'd love to hear from you today. Uh, I think that a lot of our listeners have themselves been involved in the history that Terry is talking about. If you would like to ask a question, please send an email to china at wilsoncenter.org. That's china at wilsoncenter, one word, dot org. And we'll be happy to, to put your question to Terry Louts. Uh, but Terry, why don't you start us off uh, with the first of your cases? Uh, all right, uh, three of my chapters uh, uh, concern uh, uh, Stapleton Roy, John Cam, and Melinda Leo. So let me give you uh, just a, a brief sketch of each of them and uh, talk about the themes that they represent. Uh, Stape Roy who I'm, I'm sure is uh, known to m many of you, was born to Presbyterian missionaries in Nanjing. He uh, grew up as a, as a boy in Cheng Chengdu uh, during World War II. He went to Princeton, and as soon as he graduated from Princeton, he joined the US Foreign Service. He said he didn't really know what uh, diplomats did, uh, but he had lived overseas and he thought it would be interesting. And he had a remarkable career as a US diplomat serving as uh, am ambassador to China, China uh, Singapore, and Indonesia. Uh, we've just marked the 50th an anniversary of Nixon's uh, trip to China uh, to meet with Mao and open the, the door to a, a new phase in relations, but I think we often forget that it took seven more years uh, for uh, China and the United States to establish diplomatic relations. And this happened, of course, between uh, uh, President Carter and Deng Xiaoping. And during the seven year interim, there was, uh, there were no full-scale embassies or consulates. Uh, there was no aviation or shipping agreements, no uh, ma major trade deals, no long-term educational exchanges, no journalists in residence. And so, in a sense, the, uh, the relationship was in limbo, and it was held hostage, if you will, uh, by the issue of Taiwan. Uh, this was the sticking point because the PRC de demanded that the United States break diplomatic relations with the ROC on Taiwan. Uh, 
in order to uh, establish uh, relations with Beijing. They also required that the U.S. withdraw its military forces, which were modest, and it would abrogate its mutual defense treaty, which dated from 1954. And Carter appointed Leonard Woodcock uh, to uh, handle the final phase of the negotiations with China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping. And Woodcock was an unusual choice because he had been the head, the, the president of the United Auto Workers of America in Detroit, but he was not a China hand and he was not an official diplomat. And so Woodcock turned to Stapleton Roy, who at the time was a relatively young foreign service officer, but he was someone who had extensive experience uh, in China, with China, had served as an FSO in ta Taiwan and Hong Kong. Not only that, but he'd read the secret or classified transcripts of the conversations that uh, Nixon and, uh, and Kissinger had had with Mao and Zhou. So he knew the details. And so it turned out that Woodcock and Roy were a, a, an unusual, but really an ideal team uh, because Roy knew China and Woodcock knew how to negotiate. Uh, their talks with Deng almost fell apart, uh, almost collapsed at the 11th hour over the issue of continued arms sales to, uh, to Taiwan. Deng was furious about this. Uh, uh, Roy says that he literally got up uh, and walked around the room, uh, you know, shouting until he, he, he sat down and, and, calmed, and calmed down and accepted the uh, uh, agreement. And here we see uh, State Roy uh, uh, wishing Deng Xiaoping well as he embarks on his trip uh, from uh, Peking Airport, Beijing Airport, uh, to the United States to meet with Carter and for this is for his barnstorming tour of the US. And one reason Deng was willing to accept the compromise over arms sales was because Deng wanted and needed access to US science and technology and education and trade and investment. And so uh, that part of it worked out very, very well. Uh, State Roy retired from the State Department in 2000 one and went to work for uh, Henry Kissinger's consulting firm. And then as, uh, as you well know, Robert, he became the founding director of the Kissinger Institute uh, in 2008. And uh, he's uh, since uh, retiring from the Foreign Service, he's been able to speak uh, more pu publicly and he has been a consistent voice for objectivity and balance in the U.S.-China relationship. He is uh, one of our country's uh, most important uh, strategic thinkers on the issue of U.S.-China relations. Well, listening to this story, Ambassador Roy's story, you know, I was struck. You, you've spoken about his, his talent as a strategic thinker. And of course, part of this is because he knew China uh, really beginning from the eve of the Japanese invasion, uh, went through the Civil War period, the Cold War, knew China when it was poor, really present at the creation of U.S.-China relations. He's, his experience takes in uh, the entire story, and that informs his analysis of China. But of course, his generation uh, is now not the major force in US-China relations. And when we, we look to China going forward, we, we, we often tell ourselves a story about, well, when, when the current generation passes, we're going to have younger uh, Chinese leaders who have been educated in the West, have known integration with the West, they've known engagement, and that may be a good thing. What about on the American side, as we get younger leaders and thinkers who don't have anything like uh, Ambassador Roy's experience, who did not know China 
when it was poor, who only know it when it is wealthy and to much of the world intimidating. Uh, if you were talking to them, what, what, what would you see as some of the big lessons from Ambassador Roy's career or from his strategic insights that you would hope that a younger generation that doesn't share his experience might be able to carry on? Well, I, w I wish we could ask uh, Ambassador Roy that question. I, you know, I, I would be uh, fascinated to hear his answer. But look, we've got a, uh, a generation now, as you say, of younger people in uh, academic and, and policy positions uh, who know they may not have seen China when it was poor and, and, uh, and struggling and disunified. Uh, but they have experienced China, like yourself, uh, firsthand. They have personal relationships. So it's so different from the Cold War, when most Americans could only try to guess about China from a distance. And so, you know, that gave rise to very simplistic stereotypes. And so I think the tremendous amount of interaction that has gone on uh, within the last uh, few decades among this younger generation will, will serve us well. It will keep this, uh, it will keep this relationship uh, afloat, uh, even though we, we're, we're sailing through turbulent waters right now. And um, I, I think the fact that so many of our younger uh, uh, generation are fluent in Chinese, uh, you know, have friends and colleagues and so forth, uh, is something we need to keep in mind. Uh, on the Chinese side, I am always struck by the fact that Xi Jinping uh, sent his own daughter, his only child, to Harvard, you know, for her undergraduate education. Uh, I think she graduated in 2014. And so this speaks to the, uh, the profound ambiguity of the relationship uh, on both sides. S Xi Jinping's daughter, since leaving Harvard and going back, uh, barely seems to exist, at least in the public sphere. Uh, he studied but, under a pseudonym at, at Harvard. And right. I, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know any details. I think that your your description of the advantages of people who are in their, you know, now early 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, uh, the advantages they have from having had the opportunity to live in China, uh, to study there, to learn the language, to know people, I, I think that that's true. And, and it does uh, give them an advantage that some of the, the earlier generations who had to look at China from Hong Kong or Taiwan, it gives them advantages that that, that generation didn't know. I do worry, though, about people now in their 20s or in their teens uh, for whom it appears that opportunities to go to China and to engage and, and to do the range of things that the, the generation that's you know, younger than ambassador college students now I'm not sure they're going to have those opportunities, and therefore I worry that they may not take up China studies in the first place. Yeah, we, we, we of course, need to keep in mind that it's not just the, uh, the fact that we have, uh, on, the, on the political level, government level, more restrictions, but uh, COVID has been a tremendous uh, uh, negative you know, for the relationship, the fact that you simply can't travel there or, or you can't travel there easily. Although I was buoyed recently to learn that uh, there are more visas for Chinese students coming to the United States and there are more Chinese students who come back to U.S. universities than we might imagine. We, we won't know the details for a while longer. Uh, but I think there, there will uh, continue to be avenues. And, and you may well have to shift your, your research. You may not have the same access to archives or to field research, but uh, I think there will be creative ways uh, to continue to, and, and really uh, necessary ways to continue to understand China. But that's the other thing that really is so different from the uh, old days, and that is the collaboration between Chinese and American scholars, number one. And number two, 
the fact that many of the leading scholars now here in the United States are themselves originally from China, or for that matter, Hong Kong or Taiwan. And so that enriches this relationship. And it suggests to me that there will be ways to find con connections in the future. Well, I, ho I hope you're right. Let's go on now to the fascinating story of, of John Cam, one of the other uh, chapters in your book, um, which I think if, if people who don't know of, of John Cam's work, it, it's just a terrific story. So please, Terry, tell it. Well, John is just uh, remarkable. And uh, he was born in New Jersey, uh, graduated from Princeton. Uh, and then I think just out of curiosity, uh, went to teach English in Macau with Princeton in Asia. Uh, he then uh, taught at Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, where he met his wife. And uh, China was, this was early 1970s, and in the mid-1970s, as China was opening up to business opportunities, he became an extremely successful businessman based in Hong Kong. But his life was, a, a, well, a decade or so later, it took a uh, very unexpected turn. He was president of the American Chamber of Commerce at the time of June 4th, 1989, uh, Tiananmen uh, crackdown. And John was deeply affected by the, uh, by the protests and the use of military force against civilians. And he was especially disturbed about the story of a young uh, Hong Kong student who'd been arrested in Shanghai for uh, protesting. So he told the head of the, uh, of the Xinhua news agency, which represented uh, China's interests in Hong Kong at the, tam at, at the time, that uh, he was willing to go to bat for China with the US Congress and to uh, lobby on behalf of the continuation of most favored uh, nation trading status for China, which was very important to their trade at the time in exchange for the, re the release of this young man. And so that's what he did, and that's what happened. Uh, this young man, Yao, Yao, jo Yao Yong Jan, was released a couple days after he came back from Hong Kong. So Cam continued to bu do business, but he started to uh, collect information and uh, lobby with Chinese authorities about the release of political prisoners. And these are uh, the Lee brothers, who also had been involved in the protests and uh, had been imprisoned. And uh, Cam and others were successful in having them released and sent to Hong Kong and established uh, human rights organizations like uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International were very skeptical of what Cam was trying to do uh, at the outset. They accused him of hostage nego negotiations. But he won them over eventually because he, he was so persistent and because he got results. And eventually, he was awarded a uh, one of the Genius Awards by the MacArthur Foundation in 2004. Uh, here is John with uh, Li Baodong, who was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this photo is about five years ago, but uh, Vice Minister Li was one of his uh, primary interlocutors. Uh, Cam just uh, was indefatigable in traveling to uh, Beijing and other parts of China, visiting all the ministries and embassies and even the prisons. And he was successful because he argued uh, in a way that was non-confrontational and non-threatening to the Chinese, that better treatment of political prisoners would be in China's best interest. And because he had gone out on a limb, as it were, to argue on behalf of MFN, uh, the Chinese reciprocated and said, look, you helped us when we needed help, and we respect that, and we will always be grateful. 
So in 1999, and uh, Cam and his family were now in San Francisco, he established the Dwayhua Foundation. He uh, uh, left his business interests behind. And Dwayhua literally means, in, in Chinese, means dialogue, and it was based on the philosophy of finding common ground between the Chinese and Westerners on the issue of human, human rights. So in other words, the idea wasn't, was that uh, human rights should be a universal concern. It's not just a Western concept. Part of Camp's uh, success was not only his philosophy, but the meticulous research that he and the Dwayhua staff did. Uh, they compiled uh, extraordinarily detailed records of prisoners based on open Chinese language sources, uh, court records, uh, police records, provincial newspapers, uh, and they also compiled uh, information about laws and regulations governing the treatment of prisoners. Uh, Dwayne Dwe Hua's policy is to accept any case as long as it does not involve violence. And this includes uh, religious groups and minor minorities. And so we, here we see Cam with uh, Naguang Sandral, a Tibetan nun, who was imprisoned for counter-revolutionary crimes in 1992. And uh, John was, uh, was successful in helping to secure her release and asylum in the United States in 2002. Uh, I think we all know the in environment for human rights work has become more difficult in recent years, but uh, uh, John Cam has uh, accomplished a great deal and he persists. He will not give up. So on, on your final point, an awful lot of these cases and a lot of John Cam's success did occur in the background of engagement between the U.S. and China in a period when there was uh, a lot that we wanted from each other, the U.S. and China. There was much that we did together and accomplished together. Uh, so there was a, a basis for trust. It's not clear that that basis still exists. <laughs> Uh, can this same kind of quiet diplomacy work in the post-engagement era is one question. And I guess another is, is how does it fare in the case of something like the Xinjiang question, where the scale is so large that it seems to defy any, any attempt to advocate on, the beh on behalf of any one person? So is, the, is there a scale problem? And can we still get a hearing in the post-engagement era? Right, well, uh, it is, uh, you know, I issues like, uh, like uh, Xinjiang uh, must be addressed, but it's very difficult to make, make uh, any real headway. Nonetheless, I guess I would argue that not only in discussion of, of human rights, but in terms of uh, law, and I do include uh, a, a chapter on Jerry Cohen, Cohen and his wife Joan, yeah. Joan Cohen, uh, that there has been tremendous progress, uh, even during this much more authoritarian period. Uh, Chinese citizens have uh, rights, and they they uh, they have recourse uh, to certain rights. There are limits, of course. Uh, and uh, political rights are more difficult, but they have far more in the way of uh, access to a, uh, a justice system than they did uh, under Mao or you know, during the Cultural Revolution. So I think there has been real progress. And one would hope that that progress uh, will, will continue as Chinese society uh, uh, changes and uh, becomes more wealthy. And people uh, argue, uh, they want to defend, they know their political rights may be off limits, but they want to defend their economic rights. They want to defend 
uh, social rights. As for John Cam himself, uh, he has turned uh, to the defense of U.S. citizens who are yeah. being held in, uh, in China for one reason or another and has been very, very helpful in some of these cases because that's an issue where the United States government uh, also will be, be very much concerned. He's also been emphasizing the rights of women, of girls, uh, and uh, uh, organizing exchanges between uh, members of, of, the, of the Chinese uh, judiciary and uh, uh, American judicials. So he's keeping the, the, the flame alive, uh, even though working on individual political and uh, religious leaders has become a lot more difficult. Well, let, let's go on to the uh, third story that you wanted to tell today, which is that of, of the journalist Melinda Liu. And of course, uh, no big surprise, uh, really from the very earliest days up to today, uh, much of the work, perhaps the lion's share of the work of engagement between the United States and China has been done by Chinese Americans um, of many generations uh, from mainland, from Taiwan, Kong. Uh, these are the people with the connections, the knowledge, uh, the language skills uh, to help these two countries understand each other and to avoid contentious relations. They're now, and we, we can come back to this, um, they play as important a role as ever, but they're arguably under more pressure than they've ever been before. Uh, many, many cases that we could choose, but, but Melinda Liu, uh, excellent point of focus. So let's uh, tell people about her. Right, and I, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, the role of the, of the Chinese Americans. Uh, I included uh, three of their stories in my book. And uh, I did this because not only as you mentioned, Robert, their, their story has been crucial to the uh, uh, relationship in in so many regards but also because their story has been undertold they've not their accomplishments have not been uh, uh, appreciated and so i as i say i wanted to include uh not only uh, chinese americans but women and so the story of melinda Lo leo uh is is um, i think representative of everything you've mentioned about chinese americans but specific to the question of, of journalism. Melinda was a first generation Chinese American. Her parents were from China, born in Minnesota, grew up in Dayton, Ohio, went to Harvard. After graduation, she got a fellowship to study Chinese opera, which was a passion of her father's uh, in Taiwan. And it was there that she really started the serious study of Chinese language. And it was also there that she became a, a journalist. It went on from there to, uh, from Taiwan to Hong Kong, writing for the Forest and Economic Review. And then in 1980, after uh, diplomatic relations were established, uh, she opened the Newsweek Bureau uh, in Beijing. And she was among the first Western journalists uh, allowed in China uh, since uh, or I should say first American, there were, there were a few other Westerners uh, throughout, but uh, she was the first American uh, since uh, the early days of the PRC. And she, she told me, she said, if she dressed like an ordinary Chinese uh, in those days, uh, she could blend in unless somebody looked at her shoes. And uh, she also understood the importance of being able to uh, speak the Chinese language fluently. Uh, but of course, when she got to China, uh, she recognized very quickly that uh, her ideas about journalism and uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party's approach to media and the press were at odds. Uh, China's belief was the purpose of journalism it to support and promote the goals of the state. And so this meant that many of these early journalists, and I think this is still true to some extent, uh, would turn to dissidents, 
and uh, uh, protesters within China, people who were opposed to the state uh, for, for their views. So the Chinese officials in turn uh, would complain that Western reporting was unfair and, and inaccurate, incomplete, because uh, these journalists were paying too much attention to human rights. So in a, in a sense, the, uh, the party wanted to have it both ways. But Melinda was, like many Chinese American, her personal life, her personal story was complicated. Well, and that's the slide that I should have shown uh, when I was talking about uh, freedom of the press and, the, and restrictions of, uh, on, on the role of the press in China. Melinda's life was complicated because she had an older brother. And here she is on the right, older brother with his family, on the left in Suzhou in 1979, when she was able to visit them from Hong Kong. And she had never met this brother before. Uh, their parents had left him as a child, as a baby, uh, with their grandmother in Suzhou. And they had gone uh, to study in the United States at University of Minnesota, expecting to come back within a year or two. Because of the Civil War and then the Chinese Revolution, uh, they did not come back for uh, th more than three decades. But I think this experience of knowing about this brother, meeting this brother and other relatives, uh, gave Liao a very different perspective on China from a lot of other journalists and made her more, more realistic. Uh, Melinda covered major events uh, not only in China, but other parts of the world, but she witnessed and reported on uh, the, the, uh, the crackdown uh, of the protesters in Beijing on, on June 4th, 1989. And she uh, was in the square, witnessed what was going on, but then she stayed in China. Here she is with two colleagues. Um, to write a detailed account of what had happened. And she made the important point that the protests were driven more by economic discontent than they were by demands for democracy. Uh, here in the West, I think, again, because it's the protesters who made their voices known, uh, we think of it, in fact, we call it a democracy movement, but that was not altogether accurate. At the time of, the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, uh, Liao was the president of the, uh, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China, and so she was in a, in a position of negotiating on behalf of other journalists uh, for the guidelines that would uh, be applied to them uh, for covering the games. Those guidelines were, uh, as you remember, they were relaxed during the Olympics, but it was short-lived. And her concern always in all of her reporting was not so much for herself as it was for her Chinese colleagues who did not have foreign passports. Uh, with the advent of the internet in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, Melinda Liu and other journalists uh, were very hopeful that uh, the, the openness of the internet as well as the commercialization of, of Chinese journalism would lead to a new era. And unfortunately, uh, that was certainly not the case. Uh, she learned that the internet has no uh, social values attached to it. Uh, and so it became an instrument of uh, social control. Uh, Melinda still lives in Beijing. And despite the fact that fo foreign news coverage is uh, much more restricted. She continues to write. Now uh, she's writing more for the uh, Foreign P Policy magazine. She has an excellent article just recently on China, Russia, and Ukraine. And she uh, told me that she stays in Be Beijing because she wants to see how it turns out. Well, you know, Melinda Liu and, and, and so many others, they've, they've really been key to our understanding of China uh, now for about 40 years uh, in many cases. And as U.S.-China relations 
decline. As I mentioned at the outset of this of this section, you know, Chinese Americans have a key role to play. They have the kinship ties, the connection, the understanding to temper U.S.-China rivalry. At the same time, as that rivalry deepens, they come under more pressure from both sides. It's always been tough to be a Chinese American working in China, where you're never giving, given credit for being fully American. But now for the Chinese Americans in the United States, they're increasingly subject to growing uh, racist attacks, anti-Chinese American, anti-Asian. And if this relationship continues to decline, as frankly, I, I expect it will, uh, even responsible descriptions of a worsening relationship could bring pressure on these communities and these individuals were precisely the people we need to help navigate us out of friction as soon as possible. I don't know if you've discussed this with Melinda Leo, but as you were writing about her story and Shirley Young's and the other Chinese Americans that you cover, I wondered if you, if you were thinking at all about the recent rise in anti-Asian American racism and how that fits into their stories. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the article that you wrote recently, Robert, on the, the China Initiative, uh, I would commend to uh, everybody on, on, this, uh, on this call, on this talk. Uh, you, you provide wonderful background, wonderful detail. Uh, but I've, I, I have not discussed this specifically with Melinda, but um, groups, you know, I think there is, uh, we, we can be encouraged by the fact that Asian American groups and Chinese American groups have responded. The Committee of 100, which was established uh, back in 1989, 1990, uh, have been very forceful in speaking out uh, against this racism. So there's uh, the Museum of the Chinese in America, MOCA, uh, and many others have uh, made a concerted effort to make more, bring more awareness, not only to the racism that we're seeing uh, recently because of COVID and because of, uh, you know, the, the trade war and the deter deterioration of the relations, but the history of this racism uh, again, I think it's so important to put all this in a historical context and to realize that parallel to the racism, we've always had uh, the fact that there was a more positive uh, story, and that is the education of Chinese who came to the uh, United States, uh, starting with the uh, scholarships that were provided with the, by the Boxer Indemnity Fund. And in fact, even earlier, the, the earliest uh, Chinese graduate from an American uni university was Yong Wing, who went yeah. to Yale in the mid 19th century. And they went back to China and organized during the Qing dynasty, a group of, uh, of Chinese boys to come and study in the United States. So I need, to, I, you know, I think we need to keep uh, in mind the fact that this is uh, not just a, a simple, uh, one-sided picture. There are many more aspects to it, but I couldn't agree with you more that, uh, you know, Chinese Americans now uh, as, uh, as intermediaries and as uh, advocates um, are in a difficult position. This, as I suggest in the book, uh, this is not new. They faced a similar situation, questions about their loyalty uh, in the United States uh, during the early 1950s uh, because of Korean War and because of McCarthyism. We, we have a question uh, from Bob Cap, who is uh, somebody who could well have been profiled in your book as well. Uh, and Bob writes that the current Russian invasion of Ukraine and Putin's behavior raises the uneasy notion that there are deeper currents in Russia going back not only to USSR times, but perhaps even earlier to imperial times that are now at work. Do you think that similar deep structure currents are at work in China now? And did the understanding that Terry's Americans in China arrived at in their personal and professional lives equip them and through them the rest of us to grasp those deeper currents? 
And before before you answer, Terry, that's a whopper. This is, I'm going to give you a stall to help you prepare your answer. Just to remind the audience uh, that if you have a question, please send it to us at china at wilsoncenter.org. Terry. Uh, thank you, Bob. <laughs> uh, I, you know, the, the uh, alliance between the Russians and the Chinese is clearly a marriage of convenience just as the alliance, uh, if you want to use that word, between the United States and uh, China was a marriage of convenience. And so uh, uh, there are obviously deep-seated historical uh, antipathies and antagonisms, uh, you know, between all of these great powers. You know, they are always going to, you know, be, uh, working in their own their own self-interest and so china i obviously uh, see some advantages to uh, uh, working closely with the russians but now with ukraine uh, they've been unexpectedly been, uh, been put in an extremely awkward position i think we could all uh, see that and uh, it's fascinating to me that the Chinese now are offering to mediate between Russia and the Ukraine. Uh, you know, the Chinese are really in the best possible position to do this if the Russians uh, and the Ukrainians will accept it because they've got the leverage. They've got a lot more leverage than France or Israel uh, or, or anybody else. And so, uh, you know, China could be playing a very different role as peacemaker at the same time that they hope to maintain this uh, relationship of mutual convenience with the Russians. I mean, it's a big question and we could take up you know, a, a lot more time, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think one of, one of the uh, ideas behind Bob's question is, was, have there always been currents in China that we perhaps see now in some of the more uh, aggressive nationalistic attitudes that we find in the, in the Xi government, but also among Chinese netizens. Were they always there in a way that, especially during the engagement period, Americans who were working with China should have seen and should have helped prepare us for, now that some of these attitudes seem to be uh, ascendant? I had a conversation recently with a number of young students American students who had been on one of, I won't mention which, but one of the programs that brings American graduate students to China for a deep dive. And it uh, does so, they're in close proximity to Chinese students. And these uh, young people that I was speaking with about a month ago said, you know, we were very excited to go to China, uh, but working closely with our Chinese age peers made hawks out of all of us. Uh, rather depressing. Has, is this something that, that goes deep and has always been there and that has just reemerged or was it something that might have been otherwise? Right. And the, you know, you, you can see the reverse with at least some Chinese students uh, who come to the United States and become more nationalistic, right? right? But I think we, again, we make this mistake of characterizing uh, each other and characterizing ourselves in these broad brush terms. Uh, you, you know, we, we uh, there's something about the human mind that only has the capacity to, uh, you know, think in terms of one image or one concept at a time when it comes to uh, faraway places. And uh, that's where I hope the book will help to complicate uh, the, the, the images and the uh, perceptions. And sure, we've always had uh, different currents. We've always, had, you know, they, look, there was considerable opposition to the reconciliation, you know, between Nixon and Mao uh, among both Chinese, uh, you know, this is still during the Cultural Revolution, and on the, the right, uh, even though Nixon was a Republican conservative, uh, in the United States. And so, should we have been more aware of these dynamics? Um, I, I think that's an effort to rewrite history and to, uh, um, you know, I think it, that, that there's a, a kind of a misunderstanding or misrepresentation uh, of the uh, 
flow of events um, that is always changing. You know, it's always, you know, one of the debates about engagement, which you've already referred to, is whether uh, we were right or wrong to try to change China. Well, I think that's absolutely the wrong question. Uh, China, you know, I think we all know that China, outsiders cannot change China. Uh, we can influence China, we can influence the relationship, but only if China wants to change, only if China wants that influence. And during this period of reform and opening, China did want that. We are now engaged in a way, and we will continue to be engaged in a way where both sides will continue to uh, influence each other. Uh, Steve Schleicher asks whether you had a particular rubric for choosing the people that you focused on in your chapters. You know, there, there are so many stories uh, from different angles of Americans who've been involved with China. How did you decide uh, who was in and who was out? Right, there was a, a, a fair amount of uh, uh, you know discussion, discussion, and I uh, I considered some some people that I didn't write about. There are obviously a, a number of people whose stories uh, could be told, uh, should be told, but in the end, I I had to limit the uh, number, and I decided on people who would illustrate or illuminate some of these larger themes but also people who represent, represented different turning points in the relationship, different periods of time, uh, from the Cold War on through uh, normalization and uh, beyond. So that, that was the basic idea. But I also uh, decided to include people who had spent significant periods of time living and working in China. Uh, some of them had been born in China, like Stapleton Roy, uh, and I wanted to include women, as I mentioned before, women and Chinese Americans. One of the POWs that I wrote about was African American. And I welcomed that because uh, it enabled me to tell the story of racism, which has been a, a, an issue of contention on both sides. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, you've been involved not only with many of these people who've spent a lot of their lives uh, in China, committed their lives to China, but you've also been involved in institutions like the Lingnan Foundation, like Yale in China, uh, that were about engagement, education, uh, bringing people to, to both countries and especially to educating uh, Americans about, about China. How do you think these institutions that you've been involved with are going to fare in this more rivalrous era uh, that we find ourselves in? Well, it's uh, worrisome because, um, you know, we talk about people to people exchange, but really what, what, we, wish, what we should be talking about is people to government exchange because uh, on the Chinese side, while there was a considerable leeway, uh, you know, that space, uh, you know, for, for, you know, private organizations for uh, joint academic exchange and so forth, that space has, has shrunk. And so uh, in the absence of uh, better government relations, uh, it will be difficult. But uh, exchanges in some areas that are less sensitive to politics, and specifically in the arts, in music, in dance, uh, th these are areas where uh, you know politics is less subject to uh, um, be involved in, and uh, many of these arts exchange are continuing even, even as we speak. Uh, the Fulbright program has not been restored, but there's been interim funding from uh, several foundations, including the Luce Foundation, and there have been Chinese scholars who've been able to come uh, to the U.S. under the auspices of, of that program. So what has made the U.S.-China relationship so alive and so vital, and the reason why I continue to be optimistic uh, about the relationship is the fact that it is not just government to government, but it is institutions that are, are um, leading the way in many sectors. And we did not have a centralized university exchange program uh, 
between the United States and China as we did with the Soviet Union, which never grew very much. The Chinese decided very early on, and the United States accepted the idea that it should be decentralized, that American universities should be able to make uh, re relationships, establish uh, exchanges with their Chinese university counterparts. And that's been a huge part of the success of this story. Well, thank you, Terry Louts. The book again is Americans in China, Encounters with the People's Republic. Thanks all of you uh, for tuning in and for your support of the Wilson Center. We look forward to seeing you at future programs. Good afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>